Well, up till now, I suppose we've been learning about a lot of techniques for organizing big programs, uh, symbolic manipulation a bit, um, some of the technology for what uh, use it that you use for establishing languages, one in terms of another, uh, which is used for organizing very large programs. In fact, the nicest programs I know look more like a pile of languages than like a decomposition of a problem into parts. Well, what I suppose at this point, there are still, however, a few mysteries about how this sort of stuff works. And so what we'd like to do now is diverge from the plan of telling you how to organize big programs and rather tell you something about the mechanisms by which these things can be made to work. Uh, the main reason for this is demystification, if you will. Uh, we have a lot of mysteries left, like exactly how it is the case that a uh, program is controlled, how a computer sort of knows what the next thing to do is, or something like that. And what I'd like to do now is make that clear to you that even if you've never played with a physical computer before, the, the me mechanism is really very simple and that you can understand it completely with no trouble. So I'd like to start by imagining that we, what we're gonna, the way we're going to do this, by the way, is we're going to take some very simple list programs, very simple list programs, and transform them into hardware. I'm not going to worry about some intermediate step of going through some existing computer machine language and then showing you how that computer works because that's not as illuminating. So what I'm really going to show you is how, how a piece of machinery can be built to do a job which you have written down as a program. A program is, in fact, a description of a machine. We're going to start with a very simple program, proceed to show you some, some simple mechanisms, proceed to a little few more complicated programs, and then later show you a not very complicated program, how the evaluator transforms into a piece of hardware. And of course, at that point, you've made the universal transition and can execute any program imaginable with a piece of well-defined hardware. Okay. Well, let's start up now, to give you a real concrete feeling for this sort of thing. Let's start with a very simple program. <clears throat> Here's Euclid's algorithm. It's actually a little, bit, a little bit more modern than Euclid's algorithm. Euclid's algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor of two numbers was uh, invented sort of three, 350 BC, I think. It's the oldest known algorithm. Uh, and, but here we're going to talk about the GCD of A and B, the greatest common divisor of two numbers, A and B. And the algorithm is extremely simple. If B is 0, then the result is going to be A. Otherwise, the result is the GCD of B and the remainder when A is divided by B. So this we have here is a very simple iterative process this is a simple recursive procedure, recursively defined procedure, a recursive definition, which yields an iterative process. And the way it works is that at every step, it determines whether b was 0. And if b is 0, we got the answer in a. Otherwise, we make another step where a is the old b, and b is the remainder of the old a divided by the old b. Very simple. Now, this I've already told you some of the mechanism by just saying it that way. I said it in time. I said there are certain steps. And that, in fact, one of the things you can see here is that the, one of the reasons why this is iterative is nothing is needed of the last step to get the answer. All of the information that's needed to run this algorithm is in A and B. It has two well-defined state variables. <clears throat> So I'm going to define a machine for you that can compute GCDs. Now, let's see. Every computer that's ever been made that's a single process computer, as opposed to a multiprocessor of some sort, is made according to the same plan. 
The plan is the computer has two parts, a part called the data pads and a part called the controller. The data pads correspond to a calculator that you might have. It contains certain registers that remember things, and you've all used calculators. It has some buttons on it and some lights. Okay. And so by pushing the various buttons, you can cause operations to happen inside there among the registers and some of the results to be displayed. That's completely mechanical. You could imagine that that box has no intelligence in it. Now, it might be very impressive that it can produce the sign of a number, but, that's a, but that is, at least is apparently possibly mechanical. At least I could open that up in the same way I'm about to open GCD. So this may have a whole computer inside of it, but that's not interesting. Addition is certainly simple. That can be done without any further mechanism. Now also, also if we were to look at the other half, the controller, that's a part that's dumb too. It pushes the buttons. It pushes them according to a sequence which is written down on a piece of paper and observes the lights. And every so often it comes to a, it comes to a place in a sequence that says, if light A is on, do this sequence, or do the, otherwise do that sequence. And thereby there's no, there's no complexity there either. But let's just draw that and see what we feel about that. <clears throat> so for computing GCDs, what I want you to think about is that there are these registers. A register is a place where I store a number in this case. And this one's called A. And then there's another one for storing B. Now we have to see what things we can do with these registers. And they're not entirely obvious what you can do with them. But we have to see what things we need to do with them. We're looking at the problem we're trying to solve. One of the important things for designing a computer, which I think most designers don't, don't do, is you study the problem you want to solve. And then use what you learn from studying the problem you want to solve to put in the mechanisms needed to solve it in the computer you're building. No more and no less. Now, it may be that the problem you're trying to solve is everybody's problem, in which case you have to build in a universal interpreter of some language. But you shouldn't put any more in than required to build the universal interpreter of some language. We'll worry about that in a second. OK, going back to here, let's see. What do we have to be able to do? Well, somehow, we have to be able to get B into A. Okay, we have to be able to get the value, val old value of B into the value of A. So we have to have some path by which stuff can flow, whatever this information is, okay, from B to A. I'm going to draw that with an, by an arrow saying that it is possible to move the contents of B into A, replacing the value of A. And there's a little button here which you push which allows that to happen. That's what little x is here. Okay. Now, it's also the case that I have to be able to compute the remainder of A and B. Now, that may be a complicated mess. On the other hand, I'm going to make it a small box. If we have to, we may open up that box and look inside and see what it is. So here I'm going to have a little box, which I'm going to draw this way, which we'll call the remainder. And it's going to take in A. And it's going to take in B. And it's going to put out something. <clears throat> the remainder of A divided by B. Another thing we have to see here is that we have to be able to test whether b is equal to 0. Well, that means somebody's got to be looking at a thing that's looking at the value of b. We'll have a light bulb here, which lights up if b equals 0. That's its job. And finally, I suppose because of the fact that we want the new value of a to be the old value of b and simultaneously the new value of b to be something I've done with a. And if I plan to make my machine such that everything happens one at a time, one motion at a time, and I can't put two numbers in a register, then I have to have another place to put one while I'm interchanging. Okay? I can't interchange the two things in my hands unless I either put two in one hand and then pull it back the other way, or unless I put one down, pick it up, and put the other one like that. Unless I'm a juggler which I'm not, as you can see, in which, case, in which case I have a possibility of timing errors. And in fact, much of the type of computer design people do involves timing errors of some potential, potential timing errors, which I don't much like. 
But so for that reason, I have to have a place to put the, the third thing down, the second one of them down. So we'll have a place called T, which is a register just for temporary T, okay, with a button on it. And then I'll take the result of that, since I have to take that and put it into B over here, be able to take the result of that and go like this. And a button here. <clears throat> so that's the data paths of a GCD machine. Now, what's a controller? Controller is a very simple thing, too. The machine has a state. The way I like to visualize that is that I've got a maze. And the maze has is a bunch of places connected by directed arrows. And what I have is a marble, which represents the state of the controller. And the marble rolls around in the maze. Of course, if I, this, this analogy breaks down for energy reasons, I sometimes have to pump the marble up to the top because it's going to otherwise be a perpetual motion machine. But not worrying about that, okay, this, is not a, this is not a physical analogy. This marble rolls around. And every time it rolls around certain bumpers, like in a pinball machine, <coughs> it pushes one of these buttons. Hmm? And every so often, it comes to a place which is a division where it has to make a choice. And there's a flap, which is controlled by this. Okay. So that's a, a really mechanical way of thinking about it. Of course, controllers not, these days are not built that way in real computers. They're built with a uh, little bit of ROM and a, and a state register. But there was a time, like the DEC PDP-6, where that's how you built the controller of a machine. There was a bit that ran around in the delay line. And, then eventually, and it triggered things as it went by. And it would come back to the beginning and get fed around again. And of course, there were all sorts of great bugs that you could have, like two, two bits going around, you know, <laughs> two marbles. And then the machine had lost its marbles. That happens too. Oh well. So anyway, for this machine, what I have to do is the following. I'm going, to start the, I'm going to start my maze here. And the first thing I got to do is, in a notation which many of you are familiar with, is b equal to 0, a test. And there's a possibility. Either yes, in which case I'm done. Otherwise, if no, then I'm going to have to roll over some bumpers. I'm going to do it in the following order. I want to, I want to do this interchange game. Now, the first thing is I need both A and B, but uh, then the first thing, and this is not necessary, I want to collect this. This is the thing that's going to go into B. So I'm going to say, take this, which depends upon both A and B, and put, it, and, and, and put the remainder into here. So I'm going to push this button first, okay? then. I'm going to transfer B to A, push that button, and then I transfer the temporary into B. Push that button. So a very sequential machine. Very inefficient, but that's fine right now. We're going to name the buttons. T gets remainder. A gets B. And B gets T. And then I'm going to go around here and just go back to start. And if you look, what are we seeing here? We're seeing the various, what I really have is some sort of mechanical connection where T gets R controls this thing. Okay. And I have here that A gets B controls this fella over here. And this fellow over here, boy, that's absolutely reverse. It's pessimal, the inverse of optimal. Every line had to cross every other line the way I drew it. I suppose this goes here. B gets T. <clears throat> now let's, I'd like to run this machine. But before I run the machine, I want to write down a description of this controller, just so you can see that these things, of course, as usual, can be written down in some nice language so that we don't have to always draw these diagrams. One of the problems with diagrams is they take up a lot of space. And for a machine this small, it takes two blackboards. For a machine that's the evaluator machine, I have trouble putting it in this room, even though it isn't very big. So I'm going to make a little language for this. It's just a description of that. Say define 
a machine, we'll call GCD. Of course, once we have something like this, we have a simulator for it. And the reason why we want to build a language of this form is because all of a sudden we can manipulate these expressions that I'm writing down. And then, of course, I can write things that can algebraically manipulate these things, simulate them, all that sort of uh, things that I might want to do. Perhaps transform them into layout. Who knows? Once I have a, uh, a nice representation of registers, it has certain registers, which we're going to call A, B, and T. And there's a controller. Actually, a better language, which would be more explicit, which would, would be one which named every button also and said what it did. Like, this button causes the contents of T to move to the contents of B. But I don't want to do that because it's actually harder to read to do that. and takes up more space. So I'm going to have that in the instructions written in the controller. Okay, it's going to be implicit what the operations are. Okay, they can be deduced by reading these and collecting together all the different things that can be done. Like we look at, say, say well, let's look at what these things are. There's a little loop that we go around which says branch. This is the representation of the little flap that decides which way you go here. If 0, okay, fetch of b the contents of B. If the contents of B is 0, then go to a place called done. Now, one thing you're seeing here, this looks very much like a traditional computer language. And what you're seeing here is things like labels that represent places in a sequence written down as a sequence. The reason why they're needed is because over here, I've written something with loops. But if I'm writing English text or something like that, it's hard to refer to a place. I don't have arrows. Arrows are, arrows are represented by giving names to the places where the arrows terminate and then referring to them by those names. Now, this is just an encoding. There's nothing magical about things like that. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to say, how do, we, how do we do t gets r? Oh, that's easy enough. So assign. We assign to t the remainder. A sign is, a, is the name of the button. Okay, that's the button pusher. A sign to t the remainder, and here's the representation of the operation. When we divide the fetch of a, 